Linakaki, can you please introduce today's speaker? In 1917, as the Bolsheviks were seizing power in Russia, my teenaged father fled his home in Kiev, never to return to his homeland. Five years later, the Bolsheviks established a puppet Ukrainian Soviet Republic as part of the new Soviet Union. Now, a century later, we hear alarming reports of the buildup of Russian forces along Ukraine's border with Russia and Belarus, triggering fears of an active war in a pivotal area between Eastern autocracy and Western democracies. The Rotary focus for, P for February is on peace building. And we're fortunate today to have with us CSU Professor Emeritus Bill Timpson, whose long interest in peace building led him to write a book on peace education and to create both an honors seminar and an interdisciplinary program on sustainable peacemaking at CSU. In 2019, he took part in the Presbyterian Peacemaking Project in Ukraine. And he shares with us today his reflections on the chances for peace in this historically troubled area of the world. Professor Timpson. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I've gotten to know Randy Butler in other circumstances with some area peace work and finding out some fascinating stories about his work in the Balkans. And Cassidy, is that right? Yes, Lena. 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 Um, in terms of Ukraine background and Cassidy in terms of Rwanda, next to Burundi, historic tensions and conflicts. And I've been over there for 10 years with three global grants from Rotary, trying to pick up the pieces and contributing something to a new generation that can get along when a lot of people too quickly point to tribalism, you've probably heard that, uh, you dig back a little history, and that's some of my work, and you find out that the Germans uh, colonized Rwanda and Burundi, and they brought in a very hierarchical, racist uh, structure, and they put the minority in charge, they put the Tutsi in charge, told them that they were superior, told the Hutu majority, 85%, that they were inferior. In 100 years, they ruled that and took what they could and wanted from that area of Africa. Surprise, surprise, there's tension between the tribes. And part of what we're doing there in peace building is saying, let's look deeper into the history of why uh, these tensions are here and how we can move forward. So Rotary has is, is been key to my work. It started some of you uh, Vietnam era uh, college graduates. That was a one war I was clear I did not want to participate in. So I got a, uh, a deferment for teaching inner city Cleveland. And this is 1968. I show up to teach. King had been killed. Bobby Kennedy had been killed. The east side of Cleveland was in flames. Police were being shot. Uh, protesters were being shot. And I was at the largest junior high school in Cleveland, in Ohio, and 100% African American. Black Panthers were, were around. The junior Black Panthers were around. And we were there to, to teach and to help that community move forward. In the midst of all that, it was very clear, put on your parent hat, parents wanted their kids to have an education because that was the way out of a tough, Industry was leaving Cleveland. There weren't a lot of opportunities. And so we were there to serve those families and help them get forward despite all this craziness. Fast forward graduate school, I wanted to look at uh, conflicts. I ended up at Colorado State uh, teaching in School of Ed. And if you put on your educator's hat or your parent's hat, all of that work is about learning to cooperate. We never teach kids to start a fight. We teach kids about uh, resolving fights, using communication, using empathy, those kind of skills. So that, that's where all this foundation was set. And then the 7-Eleven came, and uh, George Bush started beating the drums of war. And uh, 
all those memories sort of came back about Vietnam. I saw all kinds of problems with the logic the administration was offering. The evidence that was the intelligence gave us out of the, the uh, you know, the weapons of mass destruction that, pro that proved uh, completely false. And I was interacting with students in terms of what do you think about this war that's, that's being started up? And I was shocked and dismayed how many were shrinking from the conversation. Well, if our country goes to war, of course, I can't be critical. There are ROTC students on campus, some of my uh, fellow classmates, and so they were shrinking from the conversation, and I, I was dismayed. As an educator in a democracy, we, my underlying faith is we have to teach critical thinking. We have to teach people uh, abilities and skills for uh, working through conflicts in civil ways, in nonviolent ways. And so that got me going, and I read Elise Boulding's book, Cultures of Peace. Does that resonate with any of you? Fascinating book, and she said, wean yourself from headlines, wean yourself from the news, because all you're gonna get is if it bleeds, it leads. The headlines are about violence. You gotta go to places where peace has happened. So I took that and got a Fulbright Award and went to Northern Ireland because they had, after 400 years of conflict, signed a peace treaty. And it was holding, and I wanted to understand how they did that. Then I had another Fulbright a few years later to go to Korea, where the armistice was there, Graduate Institute of Peace Studies, very similar to the Rotary Centers. You know, every country trains its military, very few train its peace advocates. And so in, in Seoul, South Korea, I got just below the DMZ, there was a Graduate Institute of Peace Studies fascinating students from around the world. And then finally, uh, uh, Burundi. I had another Fulbright to go there and start a program uh, in, uh, in, in peacemaking and uh, with undergraduates there and then followed that up with Rotary Global Grants. So if any of you have projects, connections, there's a wonderful marriage between Fulbright programs and Peace Corps and the Rotary Global Grants to keep a project going. Fulbright funds it once and then that's it, you can't go back. But gl Global Grants, we've gotten three of those cuts. So we built a base and then went on from there. One of the things that's happened at CSU for me is the, the very concept of peace building has morphed from just dealing with issues and we'll get into Russia, C Ukraine in a, in a minute. But students were as interested in talking about making peace with themselves, right? Their emotional substrate, their anger, their ability to handle anger or handle anger in others. So part of my course was making peace with self, and that proved very popular. The other piece that was popular, has been, is making peace with the planet. And these young people today are really out on the front lines of concern about uh, the environment, et cetera. So that led to some work on teaching sustainability and connecting all those dots. And a book I owe a lot of gratitude to Rotary for, you'll see it, is this latest one on, it's called Learning Life's Lessons, connecting peace building with diversity issues. We have all this racial justice out in the world, sustainability, making peace with the planet, uh, and then working with each other in, in new and different ways. So. This is, uh, go out here so I can see it with you. This is Maidan Square, 2013, when people came together uh, in opposition to the, what they saw as the, um, Moscow's control over the political process. Many, many, many young people. They came, it was peaceful. And the question I wanna put in front of you is, in, when, when groups are unhappy, is protest like this a viable way to uh, promote change? Next. Oh, I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to be using this. Thank you. So it was peaceful, uh, cold as hell. Uh, they were, there was a lot of energy. There was a lot of uh, excitement about what was possible. And does this have to do something to make it work? Oh, oh, okay. The right
right side. See, you gotta have an expert in your corner, you know? You can talk peace as a professor all you want if you can't work the machine. So the um, government in Ukraine pretty quickly sent in the police and the military and huge casualties. Uh, the protesters fought back with the best way they could. This is the classic Molotov cocktail, a bottle with a rag that you throw. Uh, clearly a, a difference in power. Peace Science Digest, if you get a chance to look into the, the, this month's issue, is all about the power of nonviolent resistance and push for change. And that when people pick up weapons, it tends to intensify the violence and tends to be less successful than they're willing to stand up to. Anyway, it's, it is interesting, fascinating research going on there. I was there with a Presbyterian group for two weeks. Um, some presence of, of church groups, church leaders, interfaith. Um, this is uh, a church there. Uh, we were there to listen to all sides of the continuing conflict while the casualties were happening without judgment as witnesses. And we've seen efforts like this around the world. So uh, background in history, taught in Cleveland and the PhD in, in Madison. So this is the book and I owe a lot to Rotary for the inspiration. Remember a couple years ago when there was talk about in, be, in, be the inspiration and do something inspiring? It's like three years ago, you remember that? So I was listening to that for an entire year, the president of our club, and I, I said, okay, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna put together? And this is a book that draws on history, but then speaks to diversity, sustainability, and conflict resolution. So it was, it was built on Fulbright Awards, connecting history as a history uh, major, recommending ideas and policies that have proven effective in the past, and the supporting the study and application of sustainable peace building and reconciliation. So for me, part of the challenge for those protesting is you also have to do your homework study the history of this, understand um, uh, the, the Tennessee, the social civil rights training center, um, not, what's its name? Somebody know here where a lot of the civil rights workers went to train for the, 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 the important part was the training for the students who were desegregating the, the um, stores in Nashville, Tennessee was very intense. They had to practice being yelled at. They had to practice not responding to those who were attacking them. They had to study Gandhi. They had to study uh, the situation there. And that's what I think too often is missing when things break out into protest. So these are some of the skills we get into in this class. Empathic understanding, consensus seeking. How do you do this? There's a skill set to this conflict prevention and management, enhancing cooperation, there's a skill set to know how groups work best together, how to, peacekeeping, how to separate combatants and effectively, peacemaking, how to create new policies and strategies, and then sustainable peace building, building a curriculum, improving the skills of communication, critical and creative thinking. So that's the curriculum that was in this, this book on on teaching and learning peace. So it's, it's nothing that's brand new to you, but it's put together as a part of a skill set that anyone can study, parents can study, group leaders can study, uh, and very useful in schools. So those protests, I think, did lead to Zelensky getting elected. And he came in with a promise to, uh, yes, stand up for Ukraine, but also improve relationships with Moscow. So he didn't come in with a hard line of uh, Moscow's right or Moscow's wrong, but he came in with a sense of uh, um, let's improve relations. And you know his background, he was an actor. He's not a politician. He was not a lawyer. Lawyers are good, Randy, it's okay. But I think the, the, what's from, to me what's interesting, and he played a guy who was elected president of Ukraine. Uh, and and uh, I think the creativity that he, he's bringing to that, 
you know, in, in theater, you play a number of different roles, and he is now playing a mediator's role, and I, I, I think he's, right now, he's, he's cautioning the U.S. not to rattle the sword too loudly. That don't, don't exacerbate what, what the tensions are on out there and provoke something worse. So, one of the lessons from uh, the pulled out of the literature is identify new leaders for any of us. You know, in any of us, how do we do that? Can new leaders emerge from protests? You know, protests are one thing, but then can that, can that develop personalities? Is there a new leader in your circles? As we're struggling with the same thing in Fort Collins with Rotary, how do we get people to step in? How do we recruit new members, especially younger members and diverse members? And then what qualities does all that require? So leadership is critical, and how do we find that new leader to take us in new directions? So here's a map of Ukraine, the language. The green is Ukrainian speaking, the red is Russian speaking, and in the 30s there were a lot of Russians who were who came down to Ukraine, pushed down, recruited down to help industrialization. And they, so they speak Russian in, in the East. And that's where the, um, the, the push has come to, to uh, against Ukrainian independence. Uh, the, and you can see how it, the, the language and the Russian influence goes into um, Crimea. So we talked to a number of Ukrainians who said, you know, if the eastern side of Ukraine wants to join Russia, we don't want to fight a war over that. Now that's just on the ground meeting with citizens as part of this, this Presbyterian group. So they, to us anyway, there were several who did not want to start a war over keeping that side of Ukraine that's predominantly Russian in, in the country. That was fascinating to be. So the history, centuries of connection, right? 1922, Ukraine became part of the USSR. 41 to 45, seven million civilian losses during World War II. My granddad was one of them. He was working a steel mill in Donetsk. Uh, they were moving the steel mill east to save it. And uh, he waited too long. He was one of the leaders in the steel mill and the Germans overran him. And, and uh, he was killed there. Uh, became a founding member of the UN. Khrushchev gives Crimea to the Ukraine. So part of big power uh, gift giving. And part of the deal for when the, when the Soviet Union collapsed was to transfer the nuclear warheads out. So there's this also this underlying scare threat of something bigger and very dangerous that could explode there. So how to understand the, the suffering and strength, right? It's, a, it's the bread basket. So the Tsars wanted it, Hitler wanted it. It's a rich area that has played a big role in, in history. And Ukraine um, helped the USSR actually. I mean, there were, uh, there were those who joined with Hitler, uh, but by and large, they joined with the Russians to beat back the Nazi forces. Massive destruction in cities. Uh, the Germans were brutal in terms of their treatment of, of uh, Ukrainians. Soviets' losses, and this is the part I think not many Americans understand. You know, we lost 400,000 plus in World War II. They lost 24 to 27 million people. It's a reflection of the, the, the destruction, the evil of, of Hitler's work. There's some sensitivities. You know, when Putin and others say, you know, NATO moving closer and closer to our borders makes us nervous. I get it. Once you look at this history and understand the, their losses and the trauma in that nation. My grandfather died there. My uncle Nick was young. He moved, he had gone east with his mother. He joined the Red Army, maybe the only American in the Red Army. He was born in the U.S. And then there's a terrific film, Meeting Gorbachev, if you get a chance. Because Gorbachev started a lot of this communication of openness, etc. So this is one thing Rotarians everywhere can do. There are clubs in Ukraine. We could set up connections. Uh, I can't remember the, the audience where I heard this, but there are these clubs that 
that we can connect to and support going through all this. And Rotary puts, makes a reality of peace. So this is Maidan Square today, well, two years ago. Uh, they put up all these memorials so people remember what happened. Uh, does, you know, one question that came up for me is, are the Russians afraid of further splintering of their new nation? And will some in the West foster the splintering because they were in competition with those folks over in Moscow? And the memorials are um, keeping the, uh, the memories of the, who, those who were sacrificed alive. Will this inspire others to sacrifice, to fight, or will the inviolence inspire more peaceful approaches? There's a good friend who went with me, he's a neurologist, uh, we're looking, working on a, the idea of a book of the, neuro, the neurology of peace building. That there's a physiological peace to handling anger, to understanding anger, to understanding aggression, and we're hoping to, to do that. And again, faith-based presence, what's the benefit of that? So the questions about the resilience that come up for me is post-war invasions. You know, that area of the world has seen Mongols, Poles, Lithuanians, Russians, Austrians, Tatars come through. It's an open space. They don't have geographic borders or oceans on either side to protect them. So invasions, and I think this is part of the conversation that, and concern they have about native coming closer. The last three invasions have come from the West, right? Uh, Napoleon, Germany, and Germany. And uh, there's an understandable uh, fear, concern, worry that that's going to happen again. On the other side, the starvation genocide was, was something uh, Stalin orchestrated to get their uh, first cut of the crops that were coming out. And the Ukrainians um, were left to die. It was also part of collectivization, ideology. Right, because it was property, private property, that was evil to the Marxists and the Leninists, right? So individual farmers who own their land were part of the problem and they were pushed for collectivization. So a lot of casualties and there was a hardness in Moscow to all of that. Nazi and Ukrainian sympathizers assaulted the Jewish population. They figured 900,000 were killed and as many or more used as slave laborers. So there's a lot of blood on the hands of Ukrainians with respect to Hitler's invasion. And you know, Russia's had a whole history of pogroms also, anti-Semitic, all over the country. Uh, and then Stalin's purges killed another 680 to 100, a million too, uh, as well. So this is a church uh, in Moscow. And the questions that when I was there, part of this trip, I was in Ukraine and then went to Russia and we were in Belarus. Obviously, the Russians, many, are feeling threatened by the expansion of NATO. How many, but I wonder how many Ukrainians would identify with a powerful Russia and miss, miss that. It seems Russians are partly there. And their economies are so intertwined. So there's a dependence. Uh, so it's not so easy to separate and move forward. This is a tourist shop in Moscow. And uh, Joe Stalin, do some want a strong nation state to inspire their pride? You know, the strong man, I see that in many places in Africa. The election is part of the patriarchy, history, electing the strong leader to take them forward. Uh, that may be part of it. That may be part of what's going on in China as well. But this is a tourist shop and people can buy these icons. This is back to Maidan Square. And you notice the swastikas uh, made me very nervous, but that's been part of the pushback in Ukraine is uh, there is this um, fascist element there. And uh, I, I don't know how big or how serious, but it's, uh, it's a source of concern. These are the... Um, Battle lines. Zelensky, to his credit, he came in and very quickly he negotiated a pullback. Both the Russians and the Ukrainian forces pulled back. They were much closer and the, 
the, the, the space in between was deadlier. There were more casualties. And he said, let's pull the troops back and a prisoner exchange. So he negotiated that very quickly as a, a statement of, of good faith. But in that middle ground is this destruction for the civilian population. These are, this, this area, the breadbasket of that part of the world, it's also littered with landmines, right? And that's not just a problem in Ukraine, that's a problem in many places. Sadly, uh, Trump reversed Obama's ban on landmines and now we, the U.S. is part of the problem. Uh, and so, Southeast Asia, there's a huge problem and ongoing sort of casualties there. A run at the local, uh, I should say bank, the economies of the two countries are linked, linked. There are also health problems, alcoholism, heart attacks, strokes, and suicides. So the, it's already there, the, the, the difficulties. This uh, mother and son live in a town with no electricity, no running water, no gas, no grocery stores, and no post office. So just a mud, mud uh, path running through, running through the village. Not easy to rectify or improve upon. Here are the mothers of people that were uh, are grieving of uh, their young ones who were who've been lost in this conflict. What can we do? So this is my argument. We can study history. We can visit firsthand if you get a chance. Uh, visit those places and, and other other areas where there's conflict. Join with groups. Organize rallies. Write letters. Support rotary efforts. So this is Fort Collins, Colorado. Two Saturdays ago, given all the buildup of concern about war in Ukraine, a group of us got together, Partners for Peace. We held a small rally, or about 20 of us, uh, a few speeches, and then we got out on the College Avenue and we waved signs. And you know, I, the small numbers, it's not a big crowd like Maidan Square, but it, it gave us something to do. And for those of us who went there, it, it was something. It was, it was a, a release of our concern. Uh, that's yours truly with a selfie and a friend, uh, Vietnam vet who's worth with, with Veterans for Peace. And they've been active in raising questions about all this. So one of the um, lessons from Elise Boulding is history tends to be written about the rise and fall of empires. Right? You can track military uh, maneuvers and conquests, etc. Try to track m the maneuvers around peace building. Much more complex, much more subtle, much more nuanced. It's not clear winners and losers. So Bolding says, be, be wary of, of history. They tend to focus on the negatives, on the conflicts. Right? So any of us, we can brainstorm examples where peaceful responses out of conflicts. Uh, the mediation work that Randy's been telling me about that he's doing as a lawyer, you know, fascinating. That's one of the uh, progressive step, steps. So this is Northern Ireland, just a quick uh, through some of these other places. It's, they signed a peace accord in 98. Uh, this is Belfast today. The red glove you can see over on the right is the Protestant paramilitaries. And uh, depending on what your faith was, you ran a risk of walking on that side of town if you were a Catholic, for instance, because that was the area controlled by the Protestants. 400 years of this. So Elise Bolding says to me, go and study why they signed the Peace Court and what happened. So this is a mural. And what's fascinating, I'm walking up from this part of town just below Queens University, and I come across this tree Timber Recycling Eco Enterprises. Great story in what any of us can do to sponsor peace building. So the two men are carpenters. The woman is an office person. The European Union put money up to support grassroots efforts at peace building. Not government sanctioned, government imposed, grassroots they set up. And these people applied for a grant and this is what they put to, I find it fascinating. These are not academics, these are not uh, lawyers, these are common folks who had an idea. How do we help this country improve and, and heal these differences? 
So number one, making peace with the planet. Their first goal was to reduce waste, taking wood from that was heading from a construction site to a landfill and saying, no, we're going to turn that wood into something useful. So toys, stools, benches, etc. right? Real products instead of throwing it away. Number two, they're going to teach green skills. So a lot of the kids, a lot of the kids, this is what dominates their neighborhoods. And the paramilitaries will pay money for them to join. So they're the foot soldiers. So what they said was, we're going to teach green skills to these kids and give them options other than joining the paramilitaries. Right? So looking systemically at what the problem was. And the last one is brilliant. They said at every training site in this little tiny factory, we're going to have a Catholic kid next to a Protestant kid. And for any of you who have been on a team, what happened was the most powerful uh, effort any of us know about breaking down prejudice and bias. I start liking this guy, even though I was told from birth to hate him, that he's the enemy. He's the reason this country is in trouble. Now we're working together every day and I start unthinking that why, why was I told to hate you? We're doing okay. And they start deconstructing the lessons from parents, community, friends, and suddenly they're moving towards a new way forward in. Fascinating, right? Just grassroots, ordinary citizens. This is Mayrin McGuire who won the 1976 Nobel Peace Prize for leading efforts. She would gather after her, She's walking on the streets of Belfast. A speeding car comes by, chased by the police. They fired at it. There was an IRA guy, they thought. He slammed into the sidewalk. He killed her three nieces. She said, that's it. My old life is over. I'm dedicating it to peace building. So every Sunday after church, she would gather Catholic and Protestant, overwhelmingly women, and they would march into the Catholic side of town where there was a public space. The next Sunday they would gather and mar march into the Protestant town uh, after church and go back and forth each week and slowly recruit more folks to come along. Locals started with, with, typically, you know, you bring those people into my neighborhood, they th they were things were thrown at them, they were yelled at. Mayred said, always wear an umbrella, always bring one because you, you can protect yourself. So it went on and on. Then they invited the press in and suddenly newspaper reports went out, photos went out, videotapes went out and slowly and, uh, and dramatically the country shifted, the entire country shifted from protect your neighbor with your gun to we got to go forward in a new direction. And get this, for those, you know, we have the second amendment. The paramilitaries came to the table in the peace process and said, we got to destroy the guns. The guns are off the streets because it's too easy for someone with a megaphone to get something going and suddenly the guns are out and it gets worse and it's bloody. Along with that, the British agreed to pull the military out. So suddenly it wasn't a solution going to be imposed by the military or by guns and she deserves a lot of the credit for that. So a fascinating story. People don't know about it much unless you, you dig into it. So two women, this was fascinating. We, we have a polarized culture. They were victims of the violence. So the woman on the left has a bullet near her heart. An assassination attempt was made at her colleague. The one on the right was the daughter of an IRA combatant. So she was the town terrorist, that family, and she was scum and vilified. Both of them were angry about what they had suffered. But here's the deal, again, this peace fund uh, they came together for a weekend on the other, to, to talk and listen and empathize and understand the other side. The other side were ex-convicts, the guys who did the shooting and the bombing. And they would meet in this controlled environment, each of them with an ex-con. And they would spend the weekend and they had guidelines for listening, guidelines for empathy. And it, it will always stay with me. It was stunning. They came out. They were thrilled. They came in angry about their, their uh, injuries. They were stunned and thrilled that they felt they understood a little more the other side. So the shooters 
came out saying, we understand the suffering we caused. We thought we were doing the heroic patriotic thing. They came out seeing that these, these shooters were not psychopaths. They thought they were doing the patriotic thing for their community. So suddenly they found common ground and the common ground was, what do we need to do to move forward without the violence where we can come together and cross the borders? To me, this is a testimony of what's possible in the worst of conditions that could help people go forward. Integrated schools. The Catholic schools taught one history. The Protestant schools taught another history. Parents, grassroots, came together and said, we want integrated schools with at least 40% of one of the other populations. And they wrote a brand new curriculum. Instead of demonizing the other side, we have to have a new way forward, a new understanding. Korea, about two more minutes. This is the DMZ. This is the Graduate Institute of Peace Studies in Seoul, started by a refugee from the north who had uh, uh, natural resource money. He was our, our class. I taught a class on, on peacemaking. They're from around the world. We had some um, uh, active army. You can see the guy in the third row up on the left. He's a sergeant in the Korean military. They wanted to take the class. What was fascinating to me was the missile, this is a time, 2014, when the North was testing missiles, and it was all in our headlines. These guys wanted to study Germany. Why Germany, Randy? We wanted to look at an example of how peace could be built following the terrible And reunification. This culture is 10,000 years old. They wanted to follow what ha happened in Germany and they didn't want to get up into the hysteria of, of demonizing the North necessarily. They wanted to talk about how do we move forward in new ways. And this is just 30 miles from the DMZ, the most heavily militarized border on the planet. This is what Korea looked like after the war, right? Total devastation. Yet, they have made the fastest growth out of devastation of any country on the planet. And as a country, they've committed, this is, the, this is, a, this is not a spaceship. This is the, down, the development center where they promote creativity and innovation, right? So they said, we are gonna pull ourselves up with some new and different ways. And downtown uh, Seoul at the war memorial, you have a memorial to two brothers on two sides of the war coming together to reunite and embrace. They, they, there's some real clarity around values, et cetera. So this is our, pro, our project in Burundi, East Africa. Uh, and we've got three global grants there. So there's Burundi in the middle. Rwanda is just to the north and east. Uh, Gozi, we're in Gozi because the rest, while the rest of the country was in flames during the Civil War, 10% of the population killed, 10% refugees. Gozi stayed peaceful. There's a colonel there, and again, Elise Bolding's telling me to get there. There's a colonel who was given a direct order to go out and shoot Hutus. He was a Tutsi. And he said, no, in our, in our part of the country, we do not do that. Could have been executed. Um, in other circumstances, he might have been, but he's a hero up there for refusing a, a direct order. So Burundi, as I mentioned, colonized by the Germans. They got their independence in 62. It's a brutal civil war, but they signed a peace accord. And Mandela came up and said, you gotta do two things. You got to make sure there's a balance of Hutu and Tutsi in every government, military, police organization. If they're together, they're not going to be shooting at each other. Before it was all Tutsi dominated, right? And think about you know other countries that are dominated by one population. The other thing he said was you got to involve women at all levels. That was the essence of the peace movement in Northern Ireland, and that's been critical uh, in in Burundi. So one of the things they're doing, they're building peace houses where they're going to put Hutu and Tutsi together. These are in a very, this is one of the poorest countries on the planet. We took a walk in a national park. Never happened before we had an armed military escort because we were targets as tourists who had money. Uh, and that's what they have to dig out of. The paying for the security while this is a typical village. Okay. A uh, typical village, this is a young fellow who had to flee the country in the Civil War 
in Rwanda, then he had to come back, never did relocate with his family. So that, uh, to, to the goals for sustainable peace building to help this young man and others examine the past, reform the present, prepare for the future. That's the agenda. How do we teach resilience, help people overcome trauma, support families, and promote community, economic, and environmental health? So that's what we're doing in Burundi. That's an active peace project. The young people are doing amazing things there. And I'd love to have some questions from any of you about any of this work and where it goes. I, I, I have to, I'm on a yo-yo. Some days, they inspire me when I go there. I've been there five times. They inspire me. And then I come back to this craziness around Ukraine and Russia and the threat of war and, um, you know, I worry. Sir. Hi, thank you for coming today. I noticed early in your presentation that you talked about Eastern Ukraine and the, the desire for Eastern Ukraine to rejoin Russia. Some, yeah. Um, do you think that kind of that self-determination, self-determination where the people of Ukraine might, Eastern Ukraine decide to join Russia is moving towards peace or does it just create a cycle where you've got that small sliver of Ukrainian-speaking population that now are the outcasts within their community. I, I, you know, the Russians claim that Crimea voted 95% to join with Russia. A lot of concern that that wasn't a fair election. If, if it was open to an election and the people there voted to, since their language is Russian and their ethnicity is Russian, to join with Russia, I heard a lot of sentiment among Ukrainians let them go. We don't want a war over that. If they want to secede, uh, we had that effort in this country, uh, let, them, let them join. So I don't know what the answer is, but it, war is not, I don't think, war, making war over, the, over that area is the answer. Yes, thanks so much for speaking to our club. Uh, I guess, you know, the problems get especially difficult when you have one country occupying another right. or another people, and then settlers move into that country. And um, Northern Ireland is an example, Israel and Palestine is right. an example, and Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine is an example. So I wonder if you could comment on when you have settlers and they identify with their home country and not the country they've settled. Yeah, good question. That's a tough one. And that's why I think the, we have to recognize these skills are difficult, they're challenging, they can be taught. Kindergartners need to learn how to get along with other kindergartners. We can, our curriculum is uh, too absent of social emotional learning we talk about. How do we navigate difficulties and conflicts, etc. So that's one answer that our curriculum at all levels could equip people. Instead of reaching for the gun to solve your problem, let's find other ways forward. So in Northern Ireland, the population is 50-50, Catholic Protestant. At some point, and remember, after history of paramilitary fighting, uh, I think it was a largely the women's influence that said, look, we're not gonna kill everybody on the other side. We have to get past this, the, the, the notion of colonization still is in place and hierarchy is in place. And let's, instead of sending the Protestants back to the UK, let's find an inclusive way forward because Shooting at each other is only dragging the economy down, dragging the country down. And that's why the European Union put money on the table to help them think like that story of that, that um, carpenters who, who built that, you know, and trying to bridge the differences. So I think there are all kinds of creative ways forward that don't involve um, uh, picking up the gun and going to war and maybe an involving democratic process, the mediation. I'm, I'm hearing from Randy is a powerful new mechanism, new way forward. Anything else? Sir. Yeah. Thank you for this Normally, I have to sit, hear from somebody 50 years younger for this, for this <laughs> degree of, of optimism. Yeah. But I, you mentioned at the beginning how important you thought it was to teach critical thinking and we have a movement in this country, I don't know what you call it, but uh, you know, there's a meeting in a, in a church, I think it was in Georgia, where they're calling for the death 
of people who wouldn't uh, change the election yes. results. And, right. and then we have all of this, you know, you can't teach uh, real American history because that would upset right. people. How do you process that? And are you optimistic about our future at this point and how it might change from this to something better yeah. in, in our good, education? Good question. My dad was a, a veteran of World War II. He went off, joined Patton's Third Army, artillery sergeant, felt very good about that service. Prior to that, he had volunteered to join the um, Lincoln Brigade in Spain to fight against the fascist influence with Franco. Uh, and Mussolini and Hitler were, were undermining that, that force. So I, I grew up with those sort of inspiring in the face of uh, unbelievable military power and authority, my dad kept his, you know, we can, we can challenge this. You know, we can, we can do this. So uh, I have to say, I, I call on John Kennedy often. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do, you know, similar to the service in, in Rotary. So um, yes, it's a concern. The thugs in this country with the guns and trying to intimidate others. On the other hand, knowing history and how many people back down from the Nazi thugs and almost uh, allowed some of that craziness to happen. Fascinating book. I can't give you the title. A woman wrote a history of Jewish female resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, I can't think of the title of it offhand, but you know, we have this image of they went, too, too many went passively into the trains and into the, the, the fake um, showers and got gassed to death, etc. And she describes a stunning history of women who were considered inferior by the German occupiers, right? So they weren't a threat because they were less than. And because they were female, they were less than. They weren't a threat. They weren't male and uh, potential threat. And that these women played incredibly heroic roles in, in offering messages around in the midst of occupation, in the midst of the brutal suppression of, of Jews and gypsies and dissenters and everything like that. They kept, they kept the resistance going. So I, I, I try to mix my reading with what's happening today that's, that's threatening and dangerous with where can I find inspiring stories and where do I go next? So next two weeks. Two, it's called The Light of Days. The Light of Days, yes. And it's, got, it's gotten some interesting press because no, no one knew about that until she unearthed these, these reports. So in two weeks, we're going down to Costa Rica, one of the few countries on the planet that abolished its military. They had been surrounded by a history of military coups Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and the incoming president said, uh, military is part of the problem, and so they abolished it, and they invested instead in education and health sciences, 1948. And since then, they've been the most prosperous and the most peaceful country in Central America. There's, a, there's some lessons there, for, I draw hope from that, sir. Bill. Uh, my role now is, one, to let you know that, yes, we are out of time, okay. but also to say thank you so much. Uh, and as a, as a peacemaker and somebody who's been involved in peace building work for about the last 20 years, okay. I really appreciate this more comprehensive approach that you have uh, presented to us using both the current situation in Ukraine and other places where terrible conflicts have occurred, and yet somehow they found a way forward. Yeah. And you've, you've given us an approach to peace building that's very practical, and it integrates a number of different practices and approaches. Great. And, uh, and in, in an appreciation of that, uh, in your honor, the Boulder Rotary Club, for serving as our speaker today, is pleased to contribute 100 doses to the Polio Plus Fund. Fabulous. We got to do it. If we can stop polio, we can, we can do this other way. Yes. Yes.